Today on Vulnerable, I get to chat with the amazing actress, writer, and digital content producer, proud nerd, Natalia Ramos. You may remember her from Nickelodeon's House of Anubis and the feature film, Bratz. She is a new mama and is making informative content that covers important present and historical events in her series, Smart is Sexy, and uh, Asterix WTF. So in our interview, we just get to catch up. Uh, we haven't seen each other since pre-pandemic, and we talk about just her love of political science and facts uh, put in a historical context. We talk about AI. We talk about two-party systems. So I don't know, uh, get your get your calculator, your pocket divider, and your nerdy glasses, because we have a lot of fun nerding out together. Hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, I'm beyond excited. Good. Always. Good. I'm trying to think about the last time that I saw you. We were making bratwurst. Holy shit! That's right. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I remember how <laughs> funny that was too, because it was the pun on brats. Yeah, I thought that was very clever of you. I guess was it me or my team? I think we we well, oh, actually someone, we, I'd take you know the what? credit. It might have been me. It actually yeah, might have been me because I was very credit. instrumental in trying to help people because. We were scratching our heads all the time with this YouTube cooking show I was doing because we were just like, what do we do to make it original to tie into the guest and honor the guest mm. um, and bratwurst it happen? It was I so thought it, and it was also thankfully something very easy to make. Yeah. Because I've seen you've done really challenging oh, Jesus. recipes as I guess well. I have, huh? Um, yes. And I was like, I can make bratwurst. Fine, but the easy. cool thing was that we've actually been friends and friendly, I feel yeah. like. And, and our friend, uh, Andrea, shout out to Andrea Chung. I She's know. She's an, a legend and a producer, really and I like her very, very much. Yeah. Um, but she kind of reintroduced us. But weirdly enough, we have a lot in common because you did Bratz with the folks that produced and created Even Stevens. Yeah, and Sean. Sean. Yeah. 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 So he was very much like instrumental in my childhood, and I thought he was a really pretty decent guy. Um, what, did you have a good experience with him too? Oh my gosh, the best. Okay. Uh, it was genius. It was, was I like, was about to say that. <laughs> I was about to ask you if he said genius. Always. I was like, that's like, you Don't. know, he wanted to, for people yeah. to have that. It, yeah. It, it was, it was his, 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 exactly his catchphrase. Yeah. Um, so, so you knew that you did a good job. You knew that that, that was a take where he was like genius moving on. <laughs> um, no, we had so much fun. Bratz was such, I mean, we can get into everything, but, um, yeah. it was, it, I, it was a joy. Yeah, it really was. Well, I think it's like it was really interesting to see this guy, Sean McNamara. So basically, Sean is also my. Um, uh, he, OK, so he I think did he go to Pepperdine? I think he did. Or his wife at the time was like a professor there. Really? But he was ca he was Catholic. And at the time I was I was looking to take sacraments or something. Right. And so I didn't know. Obviously, I didn't know a lot of Catholic people, especially in L.A. And I was like, OK, um, would you be my my what do they call it not a godfather but it was like a sponsor essentially or something mm -hmm. like a it was like a godfather okay and i asked him to do that yeah, yeah. and he actually so we had this whole experience where we showed up to the church and i'll never forget it was like so different from like the grind of the daily you know um relationship that we had and not that i knew him that well personally but i i just felt like we shared something really special um, and, and I, I just think he was a really good guy, you know, I mean, yeah. he was definitely wow. trying to make a safe environment for the kids that, you know, were around him. And I feel like yeah. you hear so many other stories from people that those environments were not that great or that the people from the top down were not really trying to help. So, but Sean was not like that. And no. David, his partner too, were really great. I always felt really safe and protected. Um, when I was filming Bratz and I, I feel like Sean really was a really big part of that because the director controls so much of the environment on the set. You can, you can really feel the energy on set and, and the director as the leader has a lot to do with that. So if they're anxious or rushing, um, or, you know, like you can, you can tell if they're, they're running behind schedule and they like push you along. Um, you feel that and being a child when you are one of the only if not the only person on the set that has different rules like you have to be in school and you or you you have to wrap by a certain time or your parents have to be there like that's embarrassing enough um and that was always like 
the parent. Yeah, it's embarrassing such, for being a like, child. Like, like, it's so no, like when but when you're a kid, I know. you know, you're like, oh I my know. god, mom, shut up, I like leave. Know. <laughs> you know, I know, I know. Um, and oh. and um, Logan and I of the four brats, Logan and I were the only ones who were underage. Mm -hmm. Um, and so Janelle and Skylar got to like work longer hours and they got to do all these cool things or like hang out. And then Logan and I had to go to school. And I say all of that because um, Sean never ever made us feel like we were a burden because we had to do these like extracurricular things yeah you know it was always like oh no we got to wrap because logan and nat got to go to school 100 percent. like it was like without question it was ingrained in him from working with us i think really because i think he he knew how important that was i mean i also think that sean was very much a feminist when it came to mm. um you know having my voice be heard in my character and like making sure that I felt empowered. I remember there was this one time that there was a shot um, that was supposed to start on my butt and it was supposed to pull back. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Sean, like, I can't do this. I can't do this. Like, I, I was definitely like upset about it. And immediately he was like, yeah, no, okay, you're right. It's like, we're moving on. Cause he he, he still on. wanted to move on, but like he didn't dwell and he, and he also felt, I felt like he wasn't a Hollywood person. I think he was still totally. a really good person. So I'm so glad that you feel that way. And I think, you know, it's good to honor him. Maybe we should send yeah, this Yeah, I was going to say, I should reach out. It's been so long. I, I should reach out to him. I know. Actually, there's How an Even doing? Stevens reunion literally happening this weekend, and I'm nervous. What do you, wait, in, like, where? Like, what What do you mean So, like, we do these Even Stevens reunions, like, I would say, like, every, uh, God, I don't know, like, 10, 10, 8 to 10 years yeah, yeah. or something like that. So there's Crazy. been, like, two or three one yeah. of them I couldn't make, but this one I'm making and I'm in town for. And oh no, that'll be so exciting! Yeah, I mean the that'll crew is great. They've always showed up, and 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 I feel like wow. they've seen us grow so significantly. Whereas yeah. a lot of them, they're getting older, but like they're they're yeah. still tradesmen. They're still doing what they do, and 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 it's it is really nice to touch base because it's kind of like a family oh, family of reunion. Uh, I mean, how many years did you? Oh, uh, like it was literally you... 65 episodes, but it's just weird how that stuff like, just bonds people together. It's because it's a long time. Yeah. I mean, it's a three years, but it's yeah. like every day, long hours. Yeah. Right. I always say that it, that, you know, a, a set, it's it's the most surreal kind of environment because especially when you do movies, because mm -hmm. they're much shorter than than TV and like you go and you live and breathe an on-location movie is the uh, most intense. You live and breathe with these people every mm -hmm. single day. You're like in this isolated bubble mm -hmm. and they become your family so fast yeah. and you rely on them for so much and then you kind of go your separate ways and like move on. It's like so yeah. bizarre. Are you still in touch with the girls from Bratz? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, we're, we're really good friends. Um, they're like my ride or dies, really. Um, we've, I mean... What's what I feel really grateful about is that we have been so supportive of each other. Um, I mean, everyone's kind of doing their own thing. And like when when we celebrate each other's successes and we're there when the others are down and um, they're they've just like like true, true friends. And I, like I'm, I'm just so grateful for them. That's really. beautiful. Yeah. They like I've been really, really Brats lucky. for life. Seriously though, I've been really <laughs> lucky to have them like through I mean, for it's now, I don't know, fifteen years or something. That's amazing. It's a long time. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh my god, you guys need to do something together again then. Yeah. Like I don't know. Oh my god. I mean, are you they're... acting anymore? Like what's happening? Oh well, um <sighs> what am I doing? Um <laughs> So I, where do I even start? Um, I had a baby. I guess that's like the most important. Whatever, um, you need to bounce like, back and be yeah. on set like right away. Right, exactly. Like go straight back to work. The pressure is so real. Um, but no, the, um, I, like we've talked about this, but I, you, um, and I think some people watching like might know, but I like studied political science yeah. in college. I You're got super ass. into politics. <laughs> well, I just really, really liked it. And I'm like, a total, I don't know if a badass is the right word, maybe just a total nerd. Um, but I got really, really into it. And I started working at uh, this institute. It's called the Bergruen Institutes here in LA. And I kind of had like one foot in, one foot out for years. Um, and then it's been the last couple of years that I've just really thrown myself like fully um into my work there and um just haven't really looked back to be honest i yeah. i um i well i carved a little niche for myself at in the institute and uh 
So my partner, Alex, and I, uh, we started Studio B, which is like the video department of the Institute. I love the name. Um, thank you. I thought it was pretty. We, we were thinking like Studio 54, yeah. like make it really cool. <laughs> um, and, and you know, we're, we're coming into our role as producers now. And I find that I really, this is, I feel like I finally found my, my place yeah. because it's, it's this perfect blend of politics and film. I never imagined being behind the camera, but um, I'm loving it and I'm learning a lot. And I have to say, actually, you played a part in this. You believe it or not. Stop. Yes. I'm yes. so excited. Um, I needed this. Yes. Oh my gosh. No, I needed you, this. Thank you. <laughs> you um, don't know this, but you did play a big part in this kind of evolution of my career because I remember a few years ago when I went to your house to film, we were just talking about the cooking show. And you and your husband, Brendan, are there. Like, this was not just me in front of my computer with my iPhone, like making content for YouTube, which is great. It's amazing that people can do that, right? But this was like a real set with like ca cameras and lights and, and it was like a real production. And I got there and I saw, I was like, oh, wow, like you can do this. Like this can be done. You can create a space for yourself and do like you don't have to wait for someone to give you a part. Like you can actually be a creator and you can be a producer. And that was like one of those aha moments. So thank you for that. Oh my God, really. I love you so much. It really was. It was like, oh I like, wow, this is legit. I legit want to like, <laughs> honestly, I want to like hug you so bad. Um, I mean, if I honestly, that's wow. Holy shit. Um, if I could have inspired you, who I respect so much, oh. to feel that way, empowered and have your own agency, that's amazing. Oh, no, absolutely. And seeing the way that you two work together. And yeah. And well, he's a just, he's a perfect he's, counterpart. I think he really is philosophically. I think that, you know, um, we don't really disagree on anything. I think like we get we get like cute with each other sometimes, but it's all good. And like mm. we have a really solid communication style. But I think that's awesome. I think working together has actually only helped it. Um, that, and that's so rare. It is very rare. You guys are lucky. Yeah. And, and so Alex is not your partner. Yeah. Alex is my work <laughs> husband. Yeah. Okay. And, and then I have my real husband. But he is um, my I mean, like my biggest supporter, also my like creative kind of confidant. Yeah. And he he is not um, a front of camera type person. He's much more behind the scenes. OK, so ha we got to talk about your husband because he's awesome. I still haven't <laughs> met him, which is ridiculous. Was he? He didn't go. No, we had like a he... ladies lunch at Chris Station, right? Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, his family mm -hmm. owns. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a, it's like, what is it? Is it Michelin rated? I don't know, the place is amazing. Like, but it should be. Yeah, <laughs> it is, it's amazing. It's uh, one of the best <laughs> seafood, Asian seafood places. Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, they, but you all have been together for a very, very long time, right? Yeah, How yeah, long? since high school. Okay, so that's yeah. what I wanted to say. I was like, did yeah. he meet you when you were in Bratz? Um, so um, I moved to LA when I booked Bratz and from from Miami right that's right um yeah it was Miami I'd been coming out I'm trying to get the timeline right I've been coming out a lot but we officially moved right when I booked Bratz and um that was in January 07 and so September once we had finished it was like later that year September's when I started at Beverly Beverly Hills High oh. so it was like right after I finished Bratz it was a good high school Beverly Hills High it was Great. It's a public school, it's, but it's like it's like the most private public school it's that like you Beverly Hills to. High, like it's nine hundred two one zero. The you like know. the movie. I remember when I first came to LA when I like was like an aspiring actress, and I can I made my mom drive me to the high school, and I like took a photo in front of the high school. Oh. It was my dream to go there, but we went because for practical terms, it was actually the perfect place for me because they have of course a special program for actors. So I did independent study where I could still be a student in a real high school and like go to homecoming and football games and like go to classes there but i didn't have to go every day i kind of had my own teacher that i would report to and would give me you know it was like hybrid homeschooling i did not know that beverly hills had that yeah. service essentially yeah <laughs> yeah it was a special service for that's child insane. actors that's <laughs> yeah. so cool well i mean i went to a performing arts school but it was very expensive. Yeah. I didn't even know that was an option. I probably, if I should have told my mom about that. That's so cool. Um, yeah, it was It was fairly new when I started. I don't know where the program is now. now? Um, over the years that I was there, it evolved into like um, professional 
athletes yeah. and like any type that's of That's like working. where I went to college. Yeah. I think it's the way I see it and if you define it as high performing children. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they're at high levels of performance mm -hmm. and that requires a split focus on your academics. Yes. Because you're so focused on putting your energy and your time into something else. So mm -hmm. then I'm curious though, yeah. okay, so you fell in love with political science, mm -hmm. but at what point, you're fine, I'm mm -hmm. like itching with, what point did you like realize that you gave a shit about the world outside of Hollywood? <laughs> yeah, um, it's funny because it was a really gradual thing and it, it's not like there was this moment, right? Um, but there were so many signs along the way. I remember I look back at my time shooting House of Anubis and I was, you know, in between takes sitting reading you know the communist manifesto and on china by kissinger all these really like dense by books. yourself yeah just like sitting just by myself because you wanted to like in between takes yeah because I, I i just wanted to oh yeah God, and then so i was cool I was doing, it, it wasn't even be cool i was just really it wasn't performative. I, it was like an escape yeah it was just and and i didn't have anyone to talk to about it either mm -hmm. i would read something super cool like oh my god um like this is what happened during during mao and nixon's meeting in what, what, and nobody cared. Like, I didn't have anyone to talk to. It was kind of sad, was actually. Sad. <laughs> I would call Derek and be like, can I tell you something? Your, your, your yeah, husband. My husband now, yeah. So Derek, like, is he, mm -hmm. he's seen so many iterations of you. Yeah, a lot. So you've grown from like, just, just this beautiful, amazing oh. actress to then eventually, I mean, you've been producing and then you're his wife and now you're his baby mama. Yeah, <laughs> it is, It is. I mean, we have grown so much. Now I say we, we just happen to grow together and not apart, mm -hmm. um, but we've influenced and inspired one another so much. And he's been, he's you know, my number one fan. Like you, like go, you know, go do this. And, and why, why do you think you can't do that? And how, comes up with these like creative angles of whenever I say something can't be done, he's like, no, it can. And um, we really push each other to be better in that way. So yeah. he's like kind of the perfect creative partner, even right. though he is never seen or not directly involved. He is always involved, you That's know, with, with me. How I'm I mean, really like, how lucky. many people do you know that are like high school sweethearts that have that healthy? I know one yeah. other high school sweetheart couple. Yeah, that is like that. They are absolutely in love and they're ride or dies yeah. for each other. But at the same time, like they're very much doing their own. Like I don't I don't feel mm -hmm. like they're 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 not I mean, I wouldn't say they're not ambitious. They're actually doing really, really well. Mm -hmm. But I, I think like you guys are <laughs> you guys are killing it. Um, you were just telling me Derek's like a hemp farmer now. Yeah, he started a hemp CBD uh, business. Is that okay? Can we talk yeah. about it? Is it yeah, legal? No, <laughs> it, it, it's totally legal. It's it's hemp. They they uh, manufacture hemp and CBD products. Um, they they were farming in Nevada for a few years, and um, now they have this huge factory. And they, I mean, I can't even articulate probably what exactly he does every day, but it's in the factory and they're making like, you know, gels and all the things I you see on the shelves, all the CBD products. I love CBD products. I've had, I've oh my God, it's amazing. <sighs> I have scoliosis and yeah. it's really, really saved me. Oh my God, scoliosis. Like, uh, yeah. I remember growing up there was that we had to get tested for scoliosis all the yeah. time. Yeah, in school and they, somehow they missed it with me. Really? Yeah, I didn't catch it until House of, I was filming House of Nubis actually. And, um, I, one day I just couldn't go to set. I just couldn't move. It was, I remember it was so bad. Had you been doing something extreme with your body on I set? I can't remember now. Maybe we did a lot of like stunts. Because it was like a magical show, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. It was a mystery. And we were like climbing through tunnels and stuff. Yeah. So I probably did something. Um, but but yeah, anyway, I, I'm a big fan of CBD. Yeah. So the, the My God, though. But how did you deal with scoliosis if you didn't have CBD then? Uh, a lot of ibuprofen. A lot, uh, yeah. And that's not good for your gut, no, right? No, it's not good. So, okay. Yeah. All right. So, My husband has had a lot of stomach problems from having to take, you know, a bunch of different medicines and stuff. Like in general, he struggles a lot. Oh, yeah. And I, I remember too, when my dad was sort of dealing with cancer, he was taking ibuprofen. And, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's one of those things where it's like, it's really hard on your body. So yeah. if you can like find CBD. Yeah. People assume that CBD is like drugs yeah you know i mean yeah it's just a natural kind of pain remedy it's a natural healer and it's an it helps with inflammation too which is a big problem in today's world mm -hmm. um and um so many different you know ailments mm -hmm. that we we take a you know prescription or even a non-prescription pill off the counter right 
um, without even a second thought, right? But then you hear like CBD and people are like, oh, wait, is, is it safe? Is it okay? Yeah, we're but, so proof. But um, yeah, but, but the world is changing. <laughs> it's evolving for sure. Yeah. I think um, personally, I think mushrooms are going to be the next, <laughs> the next I, b- thing. I buy that. Because the next it, big thing. I think okay. CBD people are now so I think like, microdosing is it. big, right? Yeah, in okay. certain circles. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's going to become more mainstream. But anyway, what do I know? This is not my area. You should talk to Derek. I know, right? We'll send you some CBD, though. Oh, please I'll do. Tell yeah, oh my God, for, I will, yeah, I friend. would love that. I've tried um, different. I've, Next Evo has been the sponsor. They sent me stuff. And then Equilibrium sent me stuff for a while. And I loved mm-hmm. their stuff. There's a lot of really great things on the market to take. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sober. So I, mm-hmm. I was very confused about it at first. And uh, yeah. they actually had somebody, like a specialist, get on the phone and was like, look, this is not psychotropic. It's not addictive. This is literally just like helping your synapses relax so that you don't mm-hmm. feel like you're in fight or flight. Yeah. So that's how it helps with the anxiety. So yeah, that's mm. it's kind of like, I mean, that's amazing that it was able to help. Yeah, so many people. So many. But then people. like with the mushrooms, yeah. like you were just talking about, I do think you're right. I've been hearing more things about I think, them. I think, um, you know, especially here I am talking like I'm an expert. It's just my personal We're just opinion. Talking, We're man. just talking. I, yeah, I'm now so like because I'm I guess I'm in this <laughs> politics world. It's like everything needs to be like yeah. Not, but well, no, we don't I have think, to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, no, no. But I I really do think that um, especially with the opioid crisis that we've seen, um, which has been such a horrific tragedy in this country. Um, there's less um, automatic trust of like institutions we're seeing not just in the pharmaceutical industry oh, but like yeah. just like po- politically like around around the spectrum mm-hmm. um people trust like institutions less and less oh yeah um but but um i think you're going to see uh just people questioning more like the information that they're being given and just like assuming that oh just because like this is pers- a prescription or it's like fda approved or whatever that you know, this is what's good for me. Mm-hmm. That this now has good consequences and bad consequences. We're mm-hmm. seeing that with you know vaccines mm-hmm. and with like um, just all types of um, questioning authority. Mm-hmm. But I think that's a big part of the culture today, mm-hmm. um, for better and for worse. But um, well, when you think about politi- okay, so let's get political. Oh like, gosh, no, no, but <laughs> yeah. nothing crazy. Yeah. Like I actually, I don't get a chance to talk about this stuff too. But I actually yeah. was studying political science uh, with an emphasis in human rights. I was I totally yeah. wanting to be Angelina Jolie. I mm-hmm. wanted to go to SEPA at Columbia, where I was going at the time. And I went and interned in Washington, D.C. for my godfather, who was the senator of Connecticut, Senator Chris Dodd. Uh-huh. I was supposed to be named after him. And like, oh, actually, my gosh, wait, I didn't know all of these. Like Dodd from Dodd Frank? Chris. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. No way. Mm-hmm. Chris Dodd, yeah. I was, supposed wow. to, Chris, I was supposed to be Christopher. Oh my god! My dad went to law school with Chris Dodd. Oh my gosh, that's crazy! Christy. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, but you're Chris. I mean, and wow, I'm Christy. That's crazy. And he's it, and actually he's been a very supportive person. I haven't talked to him wow. a lot in my life, but there's been times when I've come to him, and he's been a good godfather. Yeah, you know, like that's for somebody great. he didn't, you know, didn't really know. He came to my father's funeral a few years back, and he was he was uh, very sweet and present in that moment. Wow. He was very sad that my dad had passed, even though they had they didn't talk pretty consistently. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is really strange to me that like I do I love seeing this for you and I Aww. wanted to get you here on vulnerable so that like I could see oh, yeah. the path I, yeah. I I did not take. Yeah. But it's so wild. It's like what what is it like being an actress one day and now you're like this political, like, you know, yeah. content creator essentially. Yeah, it's um it's in a way, it's strange. How, how do I answer that question? It's like strange, but then it also feels like it was just a natural evolution. Sure. I think I first so I wonder if you, if you can relate to this, Christy. Um, one of the um, hard parts of having success so young is that you, in a way, take it for granted or you don't question like this path that you're on. I always just assumed that I was going to be an actress mm-hmm. and I would never do anything else. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you had that I felt a little, I felt, I, I was, my experience was a little bit more like I'm in purgatory. How do I get out? <laughs> <laughs> but I know exactly. That's another, that's I know, another I know, avenue, but that first yeah. part of that, yes, I'm assuming that I'm never going to get out. Whereas yeah. I have agency to do something different with my life, but For sure. I just didn't know that. So yeah. I'm yeah. Really, I, I, I completely just, I never questioned it. And I had always had this image of what I was going to be and what I was going to do. And I never even considered any alternatives. And um, my mom was like, you 
have to go to college and I fought her and I fought her. Really? Oh my God, it was such a fight. What about Derek? Um, was he kind of on the same path of like, ah, college, not college? N- um, no, Derek was also on the college yeah. side. And I was so stubborn. I was like, well, I'm only going to apply to one school. And I applied to USC because it was in LA. And I applied to theater. I was like, mom, if I'm going to, if you're going to make me go to college, I'm only going to You're going to spend theater. all that money. Well, I'm going to make you do <laughs> That was program. a big realization. And also because I was paying for it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, that's true. So I got there and I was like, I am not going to be spending this mm-hmm. amount of money to graduate with a degree Smarty. in theater. Mm-hmm. Also because I, I was with, it just wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was with a lot of, like, I had done more you than like some of my teachers. Classes. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. like I was uh, like, and and I was taking acting classes outside of school. Like why, you know, it just, it just didn't make sense for me. Um, and so on my own, I changed my major. I'd always been interested in politics and I was just like, oh, let me just study it. Um, and it just kind of this, it was just this crazy kind of life unfolding. I just became more and more obsessed with it. And um, I think, uh, well, I, you know, I found the Institute. I, I met the founder, Nicholas, at a party of all things. Like yeah. Some Hollywood party. Oh, wow. Know, of all Irony. places. Yeah. And um, started reading about what he, he was working on. And then I like came in as an intern and I just really slowly started, started um, working my way through the institute, as the institute was also finding its its path, and it was a, it was a new at the time, um, a new place to be, mm-hmm. and um, they were just kind of getting started, and so it was like really excited to be there on that journey. So Exciting to is the institute like a think tank, or is it more or less like is there a mission statement for this institute? Um, yeah, we we would be in the category of think tank, but we don't like to use I've heard, that I've that heard word. think tanks are actually like mm-hmm. money laundering. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I mean, there's, <laughs> well, there's like nonprofits and philanthropies and foundations and whatever though. Right. Like there's there's bad sides to everything. Right, everything. Um, but we're, we're a research institute that's very forward thinking. And so we um, look at what we call the great transformations of our time, which are these like long-term issues that politicians can't address because they're so focused on the like election cycles or something that has like instant gratification for you know their constituents Mm -hmm. um but things that are really changing our world like like how um our artificial intelligence and gene editing going to like change our our existence as humans um how can we uh, renovate democracy at a time when authoritarian regimes are on the rise globally? How can we design new economic systems that can replace the current like capitalist models that are failing us? Wow. Like really big so I was going to say questions. really like easy yeah. questions <laughs> exactly. with just one answer really. Right. And there's, and, and, and that's exactly the point. There's no like straight line or straight answer it's really just about congregating some of the greatest minds across like a variety of disciplines and most importantly for us cultures so we speak to people um you know that range from politicians to philosophers and artists and technologists um american chinese uh mexican like literally from around the world and um you you it's much harder, but you get this like global perspective and um, really try to work to find solutions. And it's really, really hard. But it's also so invigorating. Okay. So um, I would imagine so. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's, it's like, just, like scratching wild. the itch of curiosity. Absolutely. And just yeah. to be in, in these rooms and listen to these people that I really admire speak mm-hmm. um, and be kind of on the inside of that and then learning so much. It was really hard to then like go home and like learn lines for an audition for like a guest star on a sitcom that like I really nudity didn't really required to do like, <laughs> like or like exactly anything right yeah. it was just like just like I just really it, it was just hard to mentally make that shift yeah and then you're like I'm too when, good for this shit <laughs> no, no, it was more, if I was getting amazing amazing roles like yeah. then maybe maybe it would be different but the the things that were that that like that were you know coming my way they just like didn't excite me really yeah and i think um there were many signs along the way but the moment when you get an audition and rather than being like yes like i have not like am i allowed to curse like, yeah like, fuck yeah like yeah. i have an audition like this is my job mm-hmm. instead of having that attitude i was like oh, like 
really like I have this big thing tomorrow that I don't want to miss and it's going to screw up my whole schedule. That's when it was like, oh, maybe this isn't right for me. Um, but then I had to find like, what do I do with that now? Yeah. You like have and all this so, knowledge of a career and life path that you had had yeah. since like 14. It was, it was I mean, and, yeah. but even before that, because, you know, it takes so long yeah. to get to that place. Yeah. In Miami, um, right? In, in Miami. And mm -hmm. then always, I mean, my parents were both there in the music industry. Mm -hmm. I kind of grew up. Um, with a very, very realistic understanding of the industry, which I'm really grateful for. Um, and just always like this uh, presumption that I was going to be a part of it. Um, but now it's really cool to be involved in some way. But, you know, like like producing, I think, is really where uh, that's where my focus is right now. And then yeah. being able to merge like politics with with film and storytelling. Interesting. Um, that's kind of where where my focus is now. And I'm. It's been really, really exciting. So what have your recent what have your recent videos been then? I know there's Smarter mm -hmm. is Sexy and the WTF series yeah. that you have. Yeah. So it all started with those actually, because I've always been the friend that, you know, people call up and they're like, Can you explain this to me? Like what's going on? And I do that to my husband. <laughs> really? <laughs> he he had a political science degree. I know. Yeah, we talked about that too. <laughs> like, we're just a bunch. Let's just like all just quit our jobs. I know, right? Like, and just yeah, just Try like to start this world. Start the, exactly. <laughs> or start our own political think tank. Um, but uh, what was I even saying? I was uh, no, 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 no. Oh, oh, oh the sexy. videos. Yeah. So it started honestly just for fun. Um, but I realized I'm actually really good at taking complicated topics and concepts and breaking them down and explaining them in a way that is easy to understand, not condescending. Like you're not dumb because you don't know this. Like, why should you know this? No one has like no one's talking about this um, and putting it in historical context. Like, how did we get here? Or history is just so damn cool. Like, you should know this. Like, it excites me. And so mm -hmm. I just want to talk about it. So I had so much fun doing um, the, my you know, WTF is happening videos. And and then Smart is Sexy started when um, I had all these opportunities to interview people. And I really just wanted to to make like being smart an asset. Like it's not just like whether you're, you know, how beautiful you are, if you wear the best clothes or like what is sexy, whatever, like your your mind, like like having knowledge and being emp empowered in that sense. Like that was kind of became like a whole mission for me. So I, inter I started interviewing like really amazing, mostly women we're doing like the coolest things um, and really have something to teach us. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of brand it in that way. Um, but all of that led to what I'm doing at the Institute now, which is taking these really, really complex topics and kind of breaking them down and trying to articulate them to a larger audience mm -hmm. beyond just the, the people within our network that we already reach. It's mm -hmm. about like, if we are in, the business of ideas, we need to tell stories. Stories are the best way to express an idea. I have a question about a large concept. OK. Uh oh. OK, let's go. Try me. <laughs> um, two party systems. Ooh, that's a good one. OK. Um, OK, I think, again, all opinions, but um, our two party system is broken right now. Um, you all you get are the extremes on either side that are just fighting for a narrow section of their constituency who are like the most extreme and they're appealing to those people. Then you have all of these people in the middle and you a lot of people in this country feel like they kind of have to pick between two evils and they become disengaged, helpless, disconnected. Um, I don't know what a better model is. I would say maybe the European parliamentary system, but like Europe is not like an amazing model right now either. So like as in terms of the the solution for structure, like the structural solution, that's not my forte. But I do think that an interesting proposal to resolve like the political polarization is uh, universal voting or mandatory voting. Mm -hmm. um, we have it in Australia. I say we because I'm part Australian, um, but it's mandatory to vote. And by bringing everybody into the electorate, you actually bring in all of these people in the middle who feel like disengaged and un and and like helpless. And um, you actually have like a much more moderate 
system with like less tension and it, and, it, and it calms things down. And people, these politicians are no longer pandering to the extremes. They have to pander to everyone. Aha. Uh -huh. So it's, it's an interesting um, proposition that I think could actually have a real impact. Interesting. Okay. Next topic. Okay. AI <laughs> in Ooh. cinema that you just had a lecture on. Yeah. So I just went to this amazing talk by this, um, like one of the lead um, AI scientists at Google. What's his name? His name is Blaise Agueras de Arcas. Okay. That's a beautiful he's, name. He's, yeah, really, really. <laughs> Blaise Agueras Sacas? Uh, Agueras y Arcas. Oh my God. I might be saying so it wrong. Gorgeous. I'm saying that it with like this gorgeous. like Latin Spanish name. <laughs> I'm sure I'm like totally mispronouncing it, um, but I'm saying it like I mean, you Spanish, sell it and it's gorgeous. Um, watch them. It's going to be like, no, that's not. <laughs> Someone in the comment um, section. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, please correct me. Oh um, so, no, he um, was in conversation. Actually, it was at the Hammer Museum. It was just last week. It was super cool. Um, public event. And he was in conversation with an author um, and their friends, which was also really cool. It was like kind of like this, like mm -hmm. just two friends chatting. Um, and they were coming from two completely opposite ends of the spectrum. You have the scientists who's saying that you do not understand how advanced artificial intelligence is becoming oh, and yeah. where we're going and how fast we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. And um, robots can fall in love. They have a conscious, uh, mm -hmm. conscience, con not conscience. They have consciousness. Okay. <laughs> um, and like just all of these like really, really deep philosophical things. And then the the author is like, a robot cannot write this book. He cannot put together the words and he picks up his own book, you know, like he cannot put together the words and the prose and the and the the spiritual, like emotive thoughts that I put on to pen and paper like a machine can never do that. And it was this like back and forth banter. And at the end of the day, it's like, well, the machines are learning from what we give them. It's our data, right? It's it's our data and it's everything that we feed them they're able to just the same way I'm like everyone that you, okay, everyone that you have interviewed on this podcast, they're all feeding you information. You're learning something new every day. Mm -hmm. You're not going to remember every single conversation. Things will come to you in your life like, oh yeah, like that, that will inspire or influence or whatever, even subconsciously from all of these amazing conversations that you've had. But now imagine you're a machine and you feed in every single conversation that like ever you never existed forget in human anything. history. Oh my gosh. And and they will be able to pick up, you know, the human nuance. But and when we say they, we're assuming mm -hmm. that there's like multiple, almost like personalities that have their own choice of consciousness. Right. So they have, do they have their own free will in your opinion? Or? That's, a, that's a, that's like the question. Right? Or are they I don't just, know I was going to say, or is like it just a matter of the data that is fed to them to be a reflection of the entirety of human um, like consciousness or just, I believe know, that Blaze will say, would say that eventually we will reach a point where they will have free will, where they, um, will they be self-aware? These are all the questions that are being asked. Like, uh, like, will they have self-awareness? Will they have free will? Will they, will, um, they, self-awareness is actually a big one. Like, will they, you know, be able to identify as a self, right? Right. Um, will they have a consciousness? Will they be able to love? Will they have real emotions? Or are they, is it just like data? Um, and well, and what I form will they be, be in? It's what? like, will they be in Westworld? Or it's yeah, like, I don't, I can't understand. And I think embodiment is, is another whole thing. Mm -hmm. Like, does, do you need to have a body in order to have, you know, uh, or, or a soul, you know, in order to have an impact, to like create something, to, um, make decisions to um, build, you know, to like whatever it is that that, um, that they're going to be doing. I'm absolutely not. After talking to like some of the, the smartest people on this topic, I feel really, really silly even like trying to verge into this I think this it's realm. really fascinating to hear you um, break it down personally. Well, it's, it is fascinating and it's, it's definitely, we are wholly unprepared from a, um, societal and also a legislative uh, perspective. Um, you know, you just have to look at the Facebook um, Congress hearings mm -hmm. <laughs> to see that like most of our lawmakers do not know how to use a computer, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so it's actually quite scary mm -hmm. um, because we're, we're definitely not prepared and we're, I think, um, focusing on a lot of things that 
are nowhere near as important to like the safety and wellness of humanity as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, AI is is a tool mm -hmm. and we can use it and harness it to do absolutely incredible things and work alongside humans. Um, or we can kind of create a system where it gets out of control, right. and out of hand. And like kind not, of like what humans are like right now. Mm, it's a reflection of it's, it's a reflection of us. Reality. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not talking about like Terminator, like some crazy, you know, like like that's not what I'm talking about. Um, what I'm talking about is like um, there was one example uh, with fake news. If if um, we will reach a and deep fakes like we will reach a point where you won't be able to distinguish what's real and what's fake oh shit and the amount of what is fake being out there will overwhelm what's real and the machines will start learning from what's fake and if we're if if we don't legislate this appropriately or if we don't actually like like use the right tools to address it like you can get into this cycle where like there's just such an overwhelming amount of fake news mm -hmm. and fake articles mm -hmm. and fake and videos stuff. and bots and just like uh, that yeah. uh, that it's like what is reality right like though that's like one scary yeah um, it, it seems situation. like what we are putting out there online or how we're interacting with technology has to be a conscious e consumption and then also to like what we're putting out like what the content that you're making seems incredibly conscious yeah and responsible I, I really take it very seriously. Yeah. And well, you're, it's you're also a mom. I'm, and I think, mm, not to interrupt you, but like, yeah, yeah. I think that like that's one of the things that I want to definitely focus on is like, I, I have issues with climate change. Like, I'm fucking terrified. Like, I had to have a baby during a, a quarantine. And it was oh like gosh, living through yeah. that and, and, and having a little baby and a toddler. I, I, it, it's so much when you become a new mom and then when you add anything societally onto that and we look at the people in ukraine or whoever it's like we're all yeah. so privileged compared to the, everyone around oh the my world gosh, yeah so but at the same time everybody has this their realities and we're all sort of linked more so than we realize already absolutely which i don't know if we'll ever fully be able to admit unless it was online because now people are like oh i'm so more i'm so much more connected yeah. on social media right. i feel so much more connected to everybody which ironically is true like we get to touch base with each other i get to mm -hmm. witness things about your life yeah and, and, it, and, it, and it is like i get it but this i think we're i think we're touching on something yeah which is that like how we're utilizing these privileges of mm -hmm. this technology is going to have its own its own impact but i guess my question yeah. is as a parent how do you not freak yourself out um, it's it's really really scary. <laughs> okay. It's and I think about it more now. Of course, being being a mom, um, my boss always says that we have more data than ever, but less wisdom. And if we we have the the tools at our disposal, this could be the most incredible time in human history. We have the ability to never work again. It's never if we been don't this want good. to. Yeah, like we literally are at a, this juncture where where like we could just become our full creative selves never ever have to work you know like, like food labor labor for yeah like 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 labor for money like does not need to be part of the equation we have enough food to feed everyone on the planet like we we can explore other planets. like like it the opportunities are so vast and never before in human history have we had opportunities like this but at the same time um it's also a, like never have we had this power to this this much destructive power um and so it's like you know on a on a on an everyday basis like with theo with with my son it's like well um you know what what am i going to do when he asks me for a cell phone or like you know like i don't know like how you feel about social media and all these things but every single like person in silicon valley and like top top um like leaders in technology companies every single one of them that i've ever spoken to they don't let their kids have social media like their kids are not that's like media. all the people who i know have kids who are child actors are like i'm not putting my kid in it's the business exactly, well it, it's exactly that they, it, it has been designed to to be addictive you know and and i i do think that that our kids generation might be different because we didn't like we, we didn't grew, grew up, up we we grew up without like we remember time before it mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. and and then like we had it and it was so new and like we weren't so sure 
Um, and then there's like the generation right below us that grew up with it and still people didn't know the dangers of it. And like so many of them are just, I mean, I, I feel for like, uh, you know, I like, like call it like kids who are in college right now. Yeah. Who, like, like the insecurity issues and like, especially with girls mm -hmm. and, um, um, also this like race to the bottom, in my opinion, mm -hmm. like, and just, um, there, there's like well, so many wants mental to be an health. Influencer. Uh, okay. That's like the number one. That's the number one yeah. most coveted job of youth right now is to be an influencer. Did you see that Tristan Harris interview that we were? I must have heard of it because this is something that I've heard that. repeatedly. So he founded the Center for Humane Technology, and he um, was is one of the Silicon Valley people that I was referring to that like doesn't let his kids use social media, mm -hmm. and he's like a like anyway, look him up. Anyone who's listening, look him up. He has a really impressive resume. Um, but he was talking about how. TikTok in China is all the content is geared towards STEM. Mm -hmm. And here we get like viral dance videos. Mm -hmm. And they did a study, which is one that you're just mentioning, where um, American kids by and large want to be an influencer, but kids of the same demographic in China want to be astronauts. And yeah. like, anyway. So all that was a long way of saying, like, I don't know how I'm going to respond, but I hope that. Um, like our kids' generation it might have a different relationship with technology just because there's been enough time now to see the the harms that it can do. Sure. There's um, more awareness. There's more awareness. There's yeah. these conversations are being had. Yeah. That's and so like cool. mental health is such a big topic right now. That's the one good thing I will um, say that I feel like has come out of uh, it's TikTok specifically yeah. is that mm -hmm. there is that sense of community, a human community, actually. Mm -hmm. And so it's that yeah. humanness that I see represented in some of these videos and some of these hashtag mom talk or hashtag you know because like totally. as a, and as a new mom i'm sure you can relate it's kind of like okay i don't i don't know how or mm -hmm. why you know my kid isn't sleeping through the night like yeah here's a mom that's come up on my algorithm and she's going through the same thing i am and we get to laugh about it in this brief moment and then there's another mom yeah. that said try these things and try this product and like you try that product and then it really helps you and so yeah. dude it's 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 a double-edged sword <laughs> and when you look back at history, and this is why I love history, because it puts things in context and it kind of makes you feel a little better too. Okay. But with all new technologies have come good and bad. You know, if you go back to the Gutenberg press, like the first printing press, you know, we were able to print on paper for the first time ever and like distribute books, mostly the Bible, um, like on, on a scale that was never, ever before possible. That leads to yellow journalism and the first fake news, you know, like on print and like like mass hysteria over like whatever false things are going on and um, like racism against the the Chinese immigrants who came to build the railroads, like all of this stuff. And it like our like culture was profoundly changed by the ability to like print on pieces of paper. Right. Um, and Every single technology, even before that fire, I'm sure had its own like perils, you know. Um, but that's always there's the like a but there's a whole generation yeah. of like cave <laughs> cave kids exactly. that were like, Mom, I just want to be a fire starter. Yeah, exactly. But but exactly, that's the human condition. Um, I, that kids was a gonna great always story. be brats. Yeah, always, always. Um, They're doing and, like TikTok dances by the fire. Yeah, like, exactly. Oh. It's like the, the current influencer. But that would be a really funny story to do. Or like we should call. Yuval, um, Yuval Harari. Uh -huh. you like, like, the, like. The Wait, who is Sapiens. Yuval? Oh my god! Oh my god! Like you have to read it. *Sapiens*. Okay. It's amazing. I'm that should be it. on your reading list. Um, Yuval Harari is amazing. He he wrote like the most accessible book on anthropology. Ever. It's like a number one bestseller. Like okay. it's a big. Like it's it's not a petty intellectual thing. I swear. <laughs> it's like. No, it's like, okay, so it's like, a, it. no, I'm not saying I'm saying <laughs> no, for like anyone listening, like I'm yeah, not yeah. an anthropologist. Like mm -hmm. I understood it. Anthropology it's, is very it's cool. It's sick. I, I, yeah. took a, I did. I took an anthropology class at Columbia. It blew my mind. Anthropology is wonderful. And I yeah. understand what you're saying about putting history into context. And mm -hmm. I think it's so wonderful to see your journey historically in that I've, I've witnessed you, even though it's been through social media predominantly, I've seen you grow. And yeah. um, if we were to look at that anthropologically, like Facebook brings up like our pictures at that red carpet, yeah. you know, yeah. with Andrea. And like, I remember how yeah. I feel as a human about it. And I'm just so glad that I get to connect with you still in, 
you know, yeah. in person. It's always so fun. And not in fake often. as an AI bot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I do think, yeah, I mean, there's something about human connection that can not be replaced. But maybe I'm old fashioned. I don't know. We'll have to it. wait and see. So I heard that Chet Hanks was on the set of Bratz. Yeah. <laughs> How was what? that? Well, mm, <laughs> he was, no, he was actually a doll. Like uh, we, no, <laughs> I told him a crazy story. <laughs> he was, he was a boy doll. Yeah. No, he was, he was amazing. We, this sounds so fake and cheesy and whatever, but I really mean it. We, we, there was no drama on the set. We all really, really got along. I haven't seen him in a while, but I just have said, I have really good memories. Oh, good. Yeah, oh, I have a really great. funny story, actually. Oh, please tell me. Um, okay, so there were there were three boys like on the set of Bratz, really. There was Chet, Ian, and um, and Steven. And and they were like, you know, this is like such a girl, like a chick flick. It's all about the Bratz. Like, we're going to do something called The Bros. Like, let's make a movie. And they had made all of these plans on their day off that they were going to get together and like make their own movie. Like, this is like a fun side project. <laughs> and Chet is like, you can come to my house. And they're like, okay, sure, cool. Like, let's go, like, gives gives the address. And and Ian, the way he tells the story, he's like, just moved out to LA. Like, he's gotten his first, like, big job. Like, wants to be an actor. Um, you know, like, living the dream. And starts, like, driving to this address to go, like, film this movie. He brings his camcorder, like, a 92 camcorder or something that he's going to use to, like, film this movie. And he, as he's, like, driving down Sunset, like, the houses are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And he, like... Pulls up, he's like, is this the right address? Like, no, it like, can't be, it's right. Anyway, long story short, the gate opens, he comes in. It's like, hi, is Chet here? Like, oh yeah, yeah, goes into the living room and like is waiting, oh, come into the kitchen. Turns around and there's like Tom Hanks in his pajamas <laughs> eating cereal. And like Chet hadn't told anyone that Tom Hanks is his son. Oh, and Ian yeah. is like, He's like, like Hanks, Hanks. Like literally, no, because he went by a different name. And Bratz, oh. his name um, was Chet Tyson. Oh, because he yeah, was he went to by. Not... He was trying to be his own person. Yeah, it's really commendable. Mm -hmm. Um, and Tom is like, couldn't be nicer. It's like the you know he's the nicest guy in the oh, world. Oh hey, um, how are you hey, doing? How's it going? What are you doing? <laughs> and and Ian's like, um, we're making a movie. <laughs> you know, it's like Tom Hanks there. Um. And and Tom's like, oh, Chet, like, oh, and then Steven shows up. It's the three boys. And he's like, oh, Chet, like, why don't you go down the street to Susie's house um, and see if you can borrow some of her dad's equipment? Oh, yeah, great idea. Let's do that. Go down the street. They walk on over to Susie's house. And hey, Susie, Chet, like, rings the door. Hey, Susie, how's it going? Like, uh, we're making a movie. I think we can borrow some of your dad's equipment. They walk into the house. It's Steven Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, the next door neighbor, it's like, hey guys, what are you doing? And at this point, Ian and Steven are like, oh my God, <laughs> we're making a movie. <laughs> like, how do you tell Steven Spielberg that you're making a movie? Right. You know? Oh no, Steve. Oh my gosh. He Literally, he's in. there. He's there. Oh, like, Steven gosh. Spielberg is there. This was just a day off. Um, we're making, and he's like hiding his camera, like, <laughs> we're making a movie. <laughs> like, just. Epic. Aww. But you know, this new movie came out with Steven Spielberg that seems mm -hmm. really sweet about how he was like this young kid and he had a, this huge imagination and I yeah. haven't even seen it yet, but. This is another um, angle actually that I'm really focusing on with my work um, and the connection of like filmmaking and, and politics and ideas, like, like so much of what these people have created like in their minds have shaped how we see the world. You know, like with sci-fi and like Star Wars, like George Lucas, you know, and like the things that, the E.T. with Spielberg, like our um, ideas of aliens even like so much of it comes from like the 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 images that we see and like Hollywood is such um, has such a large role in shaping our culture and like our understanding of one another whether it's you know like sci-fi in the future but also like understanding one another's humanity and um, relating to people like in, in different cultures or around the world and and I just think like there's so much power in storytelling and Hollywood in particular and just, it makes me really like excited to be part of that. Well, I'd rather have someone like you at the at the helm and no. with uh, or as Steven much... Spielberg. <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> sure, no, I think yeah. he's done some really great work. Yeah. But I do think that you know everyone's getting older, and I think that this is a new reality. And so it would be really great to have people like you have your voice amplified because I feel like you are responsible when it comes to this this media thing. Um, that's really sweet. It means a lot. Um, part of the reason why I don't. Put out as much content as um, the algorithm would like 
is because it takes me a long time to to write the script because I really try to research everything. I try to be as impartial as I can. I try to stick to the facts because they still exist. Um, and and sometimes that can be really, really hard. Yeah. So, but I, it's it's so important. So I think it's more important to just to to do um, one like really thoughtful, longer piece that maybe five people watch in full <laughs> um, than um, when you're talking about these particular topics, like short, quick, like like three reels a day, like just like quick stuff. Like it just doesn't it doesn't serve the purpose of what I'm trying to do. OK, so. Like I, I, I still haven't figured out how to communicate in that way. I know that there's a way to communicate. And we were actually talking about TikTok and stuff too. Yeah. I know that there's a way to communicate in a much shorter um, like um, brief, capacity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. I know that you could probably figure it out. You'd be the best one to, what to I, help me. If I can inspire yeah, you once again, I would be more you than always happy. always do. Let's try to make um, that happen. But, but yeah, I do take it really seriously. Good. So thank you. Thank Aww. you for existing and being you, being true to yourself because it, it really is going to help the world i know oh. it i know it to be true oh well, that's that's really sweet i hope so i hope we're making a better world for our kids <laughs> me too me too all right mama well thank you for coming oh, and uh we guess we can find the institute online right uh yeah the Bergruen institute mm -hmm. doing all kinds of cool stuff okay um, so they're just online i mean do you want um, donations or like um no not not donations okay. we are sh we just um the coolest thing actually to check out in terms of the work that we produce the noema magazine um noema is N O E M A. Um, it's the magazine that we produce. It's digital and print. And it's like when when you get tired of the daily news and those big headlines and like just ever just it's kind of exhausting and you want like really thoughtful journalism with beautiful art and like to the types of content that you won't find anywhere else. Um, I'm really, really proud of of Noema and I think it's like the best source of information. Cool. And like long term thinking. So oh my gosh, really I'm cool. totally going to take a look at that. Yeah, Noema magazine. That's our magazine. Okay. And it's, it's I want to support for sure. I want to yeah. get to know I want to get to know the Institute. Um, um, well, thank you very thank much. You. And we will not be waiting this long to see each other again. I really hope not. A pandemic yeah. will not come between us again. Never again. Not come with. <laughs> yeah, not come exactly. Um, for sure. Thank Thanks. you so much for having me. It was a pleasure as always. Thanks so much for checking out this episode of The Vulnerable Podcast. For clips of this episode, go ahead and check out the Podco YouTube channel. Links in the description.